Republican Congressman Elise Stefanik, who has been floated as Donald Trump's possible 2024 presidential, vice presidential pick, said last night that she would have acted differently than Mike Pence on January 6, 2021, when he refused to do Trump's bidding and went, and went ahead and certified 20 election results. Take a look. I would not have done what Mike Pence did. I don't think that was the right approach. I specifically uh, stand by what I said on the House floor, and uh, I stand by my statement, which was there was so unconstitutional the overreach. Votes. There was unconstitutional unconst overreach in states like Pennsylvania, and uh, I think it's very important that we continue to stand up for the Constitution and have legal and secure elections, which we did not have in 2020. And m the tens of millions of Americans agree with me. Joining us now, communication strategist and former aide to House Speakers Ryan and Boehner, Brandon Buck. He is an MSNBC political analyst. Um, Brandon, let's get your reaction to what we just heard from Elise Stefanik there. Uh, it seems like a litmus test in some ways that right now, to be considered to be Donald Trump's vice president, you have to disavow everything that he opposed, and that included Mike Pence, who did the right thing, who followed his constitutional duty on January 6th and had his life threatened for doing it, Elise Stefanik said he was wrong. Yeah, it's clearly a tryout uh, for, for BP. There's no real reason for her to do an interview like that other than to show Donald Trump that if, if, if she's chosen, she'll go out there and, and defend him to the end, just in the way that Mike Pence did, frankly, for, for most of uh, his vice presidency. Um, look, I've known Elise Stefanik for a very long time. She was actually on the Romney presidential campaign, and we worked together on the, on the Paul Ryan uh, VP team. Um, she's smart. She knows what she's doing. Um, you know, we all recall her uh, time in the House the first few years that she was there when she was a moderate, middle-of-the-road uh, member. Uh, and that's because that's what her district was more like back then. Um, and as her district became Trumpier, she saw the writing on the wall and she became a different person. Um, so she is very good at playing the political role that she thinks she needs to for that moment. And that's clearly what's going on here. She'll say what she needs to do uh, if it means she could potentially be uh, the vice president of the United States. Um, I think it is uh, really dangerous that this is the place that we have come, that you have to reject reality to as a basic litmus test. Um, but you're right, that's what this is. And, and anybody who even has sniffed the idea of, of criticizing Donald Trump has no, has no place, particularly in a second term where he's going to be much more emboldened. So I think Stefanik is sort of a, an embodiment of this of this trend among Republicans that they will just simply do whatever Donald Trump wants. His grip at the on the on the GOP has only gotten tighter, and that also was on full display this week in Congress. So, Brendan, why don't you weigh in here as to what you saw with the downfall of the border security foreign aid bill, and if you think there's any scenario where this standalone bill can get through the Senate and the House. Well, I'll give you the optimistic take. I actually do think that the, a standalone Ukraine-Israel bill can become law, and, and, and there's a very decent chance that that, that could happen. Um, look, Donald Trump certainly was not helpful with the immigration debate, um, but I think that immigration bill was almost dead from the beginning, with or without Donald Trump. Uh, they're not unrelated. I mean, Donald Trump became the leader of the party because the party has become so nativist, so populist, so anti-immigrant, and Donald Trump took advantage of that. We've not been able to get anything done on immigration for years and years and years because of those realities, and Donald Trump uh, spoke to those realities. Um, so uh, I, Donald Trump certainly didn't help the situation. Um, but I think as much as anything, it's the voters who uh, reject that kind of thing. It's the activists in the party who don't want that. And Donald Trump has been speaking to those a lot more, frankly, than some of the establishment voices that I worked for did on this particular issue. And lastly, Brendan, uh, we just noted a little while ago, um, Donald Trump wins the caucuses in Nevada, uh, rigged uh, for him, um, and, and one other smaller contest as well. Uh, you know, Nikki Haley is coming up on her last stand, we think, South Carolina, Michigan, Super Tuesday. Do you see anything, any movement here at all where she could do well enough to stay in this race and continue to be a thorn in his side? Yeah, I think the only real determining factor there is if there are enough people with a lot of money who want to make sure that she uh, damages him enough for a general election. I, I think everybody recognizes that, that this race is over. It was probably over before um, Iowa and, and New Hampshire. 
um, a campaigns end when they run out of money or a, a candidate simply doesn't want to put up with the embarrassment of losing anymore. Um, to her credit, she seems pretty dug in and, and wants to have this fight. The problem is she seated this person 50 points in the polls and a whole year of campaigning um, before she decided she wanted to do that, and that's not a very effective strategy. So there may be a few billionaires out there who want to see her continue doing this. Um, but obviously, like Elise Stefanik, you know, everyone else is moving on to figuring out uh, who the VP is going to be. Yeah, terrific. Inside, as always, from MSNBC political analyst Brendan Buck. Brendan, thank you for joining us.